All right, thanks. Um, so again, welcome to CAGJ's Art and Activism presentation with Beverly Natus tonight. My name is Lisa Colligan and I work with CAGJ and we're so excited that everybody's here. To open tonight's gathering, we want to acknowledge Livia Campesina's International Day of Peasant Struggles, which was yesterday on April 17th. Um, we find it's an especially pertinent day to recognize, um, considering that we're part of the food sovereignty movement. Um, and we're also proud to be a member of the Nationally Fa National Family Farm Coalition, who is a member of La Via Campesina North America. Um, so the International Day of Peasant Struggles commemorates the El Dorado Carajas massacre of 19 landless farmers who were occupying a private ranch in 1996 in Brazil. Um, and La Via Campesina celebrates this uh, day every year because it brings to attention the continued state sanctioned violence against peasants in rural communities worldwide um, and the strong resistance of these communities against corporate and government violence. Um, the day, though it calls to memory institutional violence against people defending their human rights, reaffirms the need to build up more just societies that value uh, human rights at their core. Um, so, yeah, we just want to acknowledge that it's a, a powerful day and a powerful um, subject to commemorate, and we're um, happy to be organizing within the um, National Family Farm Coalition and in the movement. So with this, I'll pass it along to Heather to introduce Beverly. As La Via Campesina always, I love their, their favorite chant, which is globalize the hope, globalize struggle. Um, thank you, Lisa, for grounding us in that and why we're in this struggle together. Um, so we're so appreciative to Bev for joining us. Um, thank you for being here. Bev's a longtime member of Community Alliance for Global Justice and a supporter along with her partner, Bob, who my memories are the strongest from, I mean, I think the strongest collaboration we ever had um, working together was for the People Summit that we did for the 10th anniversary of the WTO protests, which was a long time ago. 12 years ago or something. Um, I think several of you are very familiar, familiar with Bev's work, but for those of you who are not, um, her life, her art life has straddled the socially engaged margins of the art world, collaborations with activist groups and community-based art projects. Um, she's the author of Arts for Change, Teaching Outside the Frame, along with many other things, um, and recently retired from the University of Washington Tacoma um, at the beginning of the pandemic after teaching there for 17 years and is still really engaged in inspiring ways in her own neighborhood and community. And um, we're just, we're honored to have you with us. That and will pass it over to you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Heather. And, and, and thanks to all of you who are part of the CAGJ um, organizing group. I am really thrilled to be here tonight. Um, to share some ideas and hopefully inspire some of you. Um, I want to start by dedicating this talk to my partner, Dr. Bob Spivey. And um, uh, <clears throat> helping him uh, move through the transition that he's moving through, he's starting hospice this week. So um, our whole family is moving into a, a different moment with our collaboration and hopefully the ancestors will welcome him and we will be able to continue collaborating over the over what in the quantum um, tonight i'm going to be talking about uh creative interventions and emergent strategies and i um I'm coining the term emergent strategies from Adrienne Marie Brown. I hope that some of you, if you're not familiar with her work, will pick up uh, her book or just follow her on Instagram. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Um, she's been a great influence 
to many of us who are trying to pull our spirits up in this pandemic time. And um, the book that I'm writing now is very much influenced by the emergent strategies that I'm, I've been able to um, witness and experience in my own community, but also all over the world via Zoom. And the subtitle is Stories to Activate Community Spaces in a Time of Collapse. And we are in a time of collapse. No one needs that explained. <laughs> and um, let's see if I can move the slideshow forward. I'm going to take you through a little chronology of my work so that you can see how the issue of storytelling became very alive in my work very early on. Um, when I was still in graduate school in Halifax, Nova Scotia, I was having nightmares about nuclear war. And I had not been an anti-nuclear activist. I was someone who was just um, like many people in my generation, traumatized by the bomb drills that we had, um, just like children today are being traumatized by the shooter drills. And those nightmares began to populate my dream time in a way that indicated I needed to make art about it. So I created a piece that was supposedly the last survivor's shelter after a nuclear holocaust. And as I was working on it, I was invited to an artist retreat in upstate New York in the Adirondacks, which is actually where I met Charles, um, who's here on the Zoom. Um, and I was in the library one day trying to figure out how to make this installation stronger um, because I'd been invited to do the piece at uh, the New Museum in New York. And a book fell on my head in the library. It was Joanna Macy's Despair and Personal Power in the Nuclear Age. And I trained with some of her uh, followers and then actually got to work with Joanna in 1987 and started doing um, pieces, these pieces with uh, interactive workshops to follow the installation. And the reason I started doing that is when this installation first went up in the basement of a gallery in Halifax, all these people started telling me their stories about what they were doing during the Cuban Missile Crisis and the terror that they've been carrying ever since, and the catastrophic thinking that informed their daily lives, that they were seeing mushroom clouds as they were driving to work. And I felt like people needed to share these stories in some way. I created a box in the museum so that people could write down their stories. And um, I led workshops, as I said, this one was at the Long Beach Museum of Art in 1987. In the early 80s, I was also doing work about um, other social issues that were affecting me, including being unemployed. So I created an employment agency in the storefront of a gallery, and people actually thought it was an employment agency and came in looking for work. When they sat down in the chair, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an audio tape came on with a crazed uh, interviewer who was asking questions about, would you rather do indoor work or outdoor work? Would you rather be doing the laundry or reading the Bible? And people realized that this was satirical and would start laughing. But when they first came in, they would have their resume under their arm and I would invite them to sit down and the audio tape would automatically come on. Um, in the back of this installation, there was a little lounge where I had coffee and tea and books about how to create your own vocation. And we would have discussions about what it meant to be unemployed, how it, you often would feel like a loser, what it meant to be looking for work in late stage capitalism in New York City. Um, this is another project where 
I invited people to share their own stories. <clears throat> this is called Please Take a Number. And it was inspired by shopping malls and it was designed for a shopping mall. This is in an empty department store in San Luis Obispo. And people who came in to the mall didn't know that this, what looked like a giant game board was going to invite them to think about what they wanted in their life that they could not buy with money. And they would walk on issues of the day, headlines of the day, read signs that said uh, things like, I, I just need a haircut or stop depressing me. And as they left this spiral, the stories shifted that they would say things like sick and tired of being sick and tired and eventually talk about what could happen if you actually took an action, some kind of activist action that would make a difference. Um, in the summer of 1991, I was introduced to concepts of social ecology. My husband uh, had done his master's degree on activist art at the Institute for Social Ecology in Vermont. And I had I was invited as a guest artist in the summer of 91. I sat in a class uh, that was on ecofeminism and I learned that body hate was a form of ecocide. That if you can get people obsessed with having the right body, then they're not gonna be activists. And I learned that all the women who were in my ecofeminism class um, we're all obsessing about not having the right body. And these were young activists from all over the world um, and beautiful people. And so I went into my studio and wrote down their stories and painted them and collaged them and created an artist book, which you can still get used online called One Size Does Not Fit All. Um, I was also inspired in the 90s to do a project that was audience participatory called Canary Notes, the Personal Politics of Environmental Illness. And I looked at ads for pesticides from 1945, right after the war ended. They um, basically redesigned biowarfare to be uh, a consumer product, which is why you see an ad that says DDT is good for me. I inserted within these ads the stories of people I was meeting in clinics. I had developed an environmental illness due to early exposure to pesticides. My father was a chemical engineer and it was the cutting edge science of the time to spray your fruit trees with dioxin, DDT, chlordane, and malathion. All of those chemicals went into my body because I was running around in the backyard when I moved to LA, they were spraying malathion from helicopters and my immune system went into collapse. We moved to a rural village in Western Mass so that I could recover. And um, I was a new mom at the age of 41. Uh, it took a long time to recover, but I learned a lot about the people who were getting sick and wanted to tell their stories. And I painted their portraits and inserted their stories as culture jams in ads by Monsanto and many other companies. Um, and at one point, my son, our son, who was then four years old, was watching me paint on my computer because I was very allergic to my supplies and I could only paint digitally. And he said, mom, why are you always painting sick people? And it was an aha moment for me. I started to paint the healing and it was only then that I started to get well. This is a series of healing deities that I created in the late nineties. In uh, 2005, I was invited by a museum in Germany to create an audience participatory um, exhibit about the rise in fascism that I was experiencing here in the US. And I figured that a German audience would be um, very attuned to this. I took uh, headshots uh, of 
um, newscasters and I either blindfolded them with American flags or I gagged them with American flags in my digital images. And I put text on it that says things like, if you don't agree with us, you are the enemy. I surrounded each image with a patchwork of used clothing that made me think about the innocent victims of our bombs in Iraq. And I created a game in the center of the installation called the perils and rewards of activism. And people would roll the dice and land on hands reaching towards each other <clears throat> or on bombs. And so you would get either encouragement cards or discouragement cards. And when people arrived in the center and eventually everyone would arrive in the center, people would have discussions about their own experience with activism. And at the Northwest Folklife Festival, the Washington State Labor Council sponsored this um, exhibition. And um, there were amazing conversations. 4,000 people went through this installation. And sometimes there were people who were members of the Tea Party talking to people who had been involved in the Occupy movement. It was fascinating, a real sociological experiment. Uh, I lived on Vashon into, from 2003 to 2011, and my husband created an organization called Social Ecology Education and Demonstration School, and we created a green map to document what was really positive about the island, and we had visioning workshops to help people reimagine what kind of world we could live in and we created an actual Vashon green map. The green map movement was started by Wendy Brower and you can learn more about it at greenmap.org. It is definitely an emergent strategy. There are green maps of cities from all over the world. I learned something at the Institute for Social Ecology which has been very important to inform my work, which is that we need reconstructive visions. We can critique all day long, but if we don't think about what we want to replace these oppressive systems with, we're not going to get very far. So in order to visualize that, I started putting mushrooms that are bioremediators and plants that also clean up the soil into toxic images. And then I created with funding a project on Vashon Island with a team of people, including permaculture designers like my husband, to demonstrate how to clean up toxic soil, to show that food forests can be a better a snack bar in a public park. And there was a story hive placed in the center of it to collect the stories of why people plant seeds in a time of climate emergency. And this still exists today um, it opened to the public in 2011, and people are still adding stories to the archive, and it's also functioned as a seed exchange. And there were many rituals when we still lived on the island for the equinoxes and the solstices where people would come and decorate the hive and share food and share conversations. I brought students from my eco-art class to the island to pick food and learn more about permaculture design. When I was still living in Seattle, I created uh, discussion groups that met in my studio every month, and it was focused on art for social change. And from that, those meetings, I found some wonderful collaborators, uh, Carol Roshana Williams, Camilla Cooper, Matthew Hamilton, Ed Mast, and myself. We did some public performances. This was around the Juvie Hall when they were trying to build a renovation. Um, and we tried to imagine the future. What would it be like for people to come back and look at this site where we were putting children in cages? Um, that group also helped me brainstorm this installation which was in Seattle as well as in Brighton, England. Um, it, the name of the piece is we, don't, we Almost Didn't Make It. And it basically invites the audience 
to reimagine uh, themselves as activists. Um, and uh, there was a sign that said, what choices you make and what actions you take may make it possible for us to not only exist, but thrive. And so people were invited to walk through trauma curtains. And this is what a trauma curtain looked like. Um, drowning in plastic, monsters in power with fingers on buttons, hate crimes increasing, um, hurricanes one after another. And once they created an artifact out of the junk that was on that table that represented something precious to them that might not exist in 150 years, they had to insert a commitment to an action that might make a difference, that might help our descendants not just survive, but thrive. And before they placed this artifact in the portal of possibilities, they had to wipe their feet on these doormats of despair to get that energy out of their bodies. Um, those doormats were very popular. <laughs> and I'm gonna close with a few other pieces that are more recent. We moved to Tacoma in 2016. I joined 350 Tacoma to find out how we could stop the opening of a refinery for liquefied natural gas. Um, and people, the activists in town were trying to inform people that if there was an accident at this refinery in the port, that it would be an explosion like five Hiroshima bombs. Mm -hmm. And the Puyallup tribe actually created a map to indicate how much would be destroyed. But fear wasn't working to get people involved. And I felt that people needed to reimagine the port free of fossil fuels. So I got funding to lead workshops <clears throat> to help people see that it was possible to um, turn things around, that the multinational Puget Sound Energy really didn't have the power that the people with imagination did. And um, we did workshops for almost a year. We took the work to various locations. Uh, we collaborated with not just the Puyallup tribe and environmental activists locally, but also with members of many Coast Salish tribes. Um, and people took this to heart and we went to the South Sound Sustainability Expo and Ocean Fest and people drew and collaged. And uh, our plan was to digitize all these images and project them on buildings all over Tacoma. But then the pandemic happened. Just before the pandemic happened, we had a parade of luminaries called the Wake to Extinction, where we gave a eulogy for all the insects that are going extinct. Um, and also just before the pandemic, I traveled to China to do walking meditation with eco art classes in Chongqing in the Sichuan province. I got back to the States two weeks before the borders closed and the pandemic started here. Um, one project I did during the pandemic that I wanted to share that's important collaboration with the research of urban ecologist, Dr. Christopher Schell, who used to be at UW Tacoma, but is now at UC Berkeley. Um, this artist book um, talks about how um, coyotes, urban coyotes and gentrification and the effect it has on marginalized groups, particularly the black and brown populations. Um, it needs to be examined. And this is what Dr. Christopher Schell's research looks at, looks carefully at. 350 Tacoma asked me to um, create a <clears throat> um, series of banners for their windows during the pandemic. And I invited Saire Rafay, who is a local artist, uh, and, and they asked Geraldo Pena, El Grey, and Speak, Speak Thunder Berry to help. And we created eight banners for the windows, um, all 
inside wearing masks in, during the smoke season. And we wanted to inspire people walking by to believe that there's still a movement possible and that we can repair and regenerate, replenish and reimagine. Um, another pandemic project that I created was called the Dead Ocean Scrolls and Other Possible Futures. I took the old trauma curtains and I painted webs uh, on them and placed pandemic healing deities in their centers. This one is the weather calming deity. Um, I needed to believe that the trauma could be healed. Um, that was really a necessity for me. And I wanted to imagine these scrolls being discovered in the future. This one says we planted millions of trees and by creating healthy soil, we restored the water cycles. We did this work with focus and compassion, knowing that future that failure meant extinction. And this one, which had said monsters in power with fingers on buttons now says, we took apart the tools of destruction and patiently sat with our shadow selves. We learned to share power so that everyone's voice was heard and collaboration was a virtue. And this is the deity who juggles, who is helping heal this trauma curtain. Um, this is mycelial deity. Um, and uh, I'm not going to read this one as well. And this is this also has text that heals the radioactive oceans. And this is Navig Navigator Bodhisattva. These are two other healing deities, Akilanda, the goddess of never not broken, and tree spirit. So the final project, the Story Hive project, which is the work that is really occupying me now um, in a positive way. Um, it's the last project of social ecology education and demonstration school. Um, Bob took this on and he is the gray haired man in the center of the photo of the right. Um, our neighbors to uh, the right of us have the corner property and during the pandemic, we were talking over the fence and they said, we'd really like to do something with the corner of our property on the intersection. And I told them about the story hive on Vashon and they said, could we create a story hive? I said, sure. And we can focus on how people are navigating the pandemic and what challenges they're still facing and what mutual aid we can provide and what dreams we can we, we might have for the future we can co-create as the pandemic times shift. And they were so excited. So I created a poster. We did not ask permission of the city. We did not get funding. We just did this as disobedient art. Everybody participated. We did a skill inventory because most of the neighbors said, I'm not an artist. And I said, but you have skills, don't you? And so we made list of what those skills were. We decided to make the project out of cob. So we would put music on and dance and in the clay and the soil and the straw. <clears throat> and we built this wonderful story hive that still exists today. Um, we painted the questions on the outside. Um, I don't live on the corner, but the neighbors who live on the corner say the story hive is busy every day. People are either reading stories or leaving stories. It's the honey of our community. I've applied for a grant to facilitate workshops so that there are story hives all over town and that we can have a curriculum online so that people can learn how to create a story hive in their neighborhood. We need to have more art that creates dialogue that helps people process their trauma and helps people vision what we want to create. It's essential for this threshold time that we're moving through. Um, this is a street mandala that the Story Hive group decided to do to slow the traffic on this very busy intersection. And I wanted to share with you if this will load the video that was created 
um, by Ron Perillo. Um, and I hope you can hear the sound. He composed the music. And Ron lived about a block away. I can see it, but I can't hear it, but it's still impactful being able to see it. Okay. Oops. Oops, I'm sorry. I I did something wrong. Um but you got an idea of it. I think that's enough. I'm going to show um, the people reading and writing. This is a Halloween installation of the story. I, this is what it looks like after two winters. And um, I'm going to close with some emergent strategies of my friends. This is the ZAD in France. It is. It was started as an act of civil disobedience an occupation of land that was uh, the French government wanted to turn into an airport. Um, for over two decades, activists, environmental activists tried to prevent this airport from being built. And the occupation um, became known as the Zone à Défendre. Uh, it's north of Nantes in a, a area, uh, the river valley of the Loire River, um, they were successful. Um, they prevented the building of an airport by squatting on the land and making art. And they created a book called We Are Nature Defending Itself, which I highly recommend. I was one of the readers of the book and gave them feedback on it. Is it Isabel and Jay um, hosted Bob and I when we went to visit the ZAD in 2017. It was attacked in 2018 by the French police um, and they successfully pushed them away, um, not without injury, not without many buildings being torn down. Another very successful emergent strategy art uh, project it has been co uh, coordinated by Margareta Howard and Tara Hui. Um, this is a project where they graft um, fruit branches onto decorative trees in areas of ur urban areas which are absent of supermarkets. Um, and, you know, it's a part of a technique that has become viral, and they train people in how to do this. Um, the Bubble Pop Pops project is um, something created by the artist Lorencia Strauss in Miami Beach. Um, she, you know, she's very aware of uh, water rising in that part of the world, and she decided to create uh, popsicles. Um, it, people would get these popsicles that look like those little bubble things with snow inside them. Um, and snow globes, they're called. And she used that as her mold for the bubble pops. And in order to get one, people to, had to write down a story about either being a refugee or what it felt like to know that the water was rising um, or what it meant to be an immigrant or to survive extreme weather. Lorencia does a lot of collaboration with the tribes in Southern Florida who are trying to um, keep the fossil fuel companies out of their turf. And she does a lot of collaborations with them. Um, Nicholas Galanan, uh, who is also uh, known as Yail Yatsin, is a Tingli artist who is doing projects to try and get art audiences and the public to be aware of colonization. And this was an excavation he created to talk about the legacy of Captain Cook. Uh, Wangechi Mutu has created videos to talk about 
colonization and consumerism. And this is um, her project called The End of Eating Everything, which you can see online. And finally, I'm going to close with a manifesto that I created for an organization called Eco Art Space. Um, these are the seven, uh, maybe they're more than seven, I can't remember, but I'll just read them to you, the spectrum of eco art interventions needed now. Remediate what's been damaged via permaculture design, contextualize the causes of the damage and expand the use of truly green technologies, disobedient actions and cultural work that interrupts the mach machinery of petro capitalism, Liberate the common so we can process our collective grief together and share stories that foster connection. Rituals that encourage a more sacred relationship with the natural world via walking meditation and communal celebrations. Decolonial and anti-racist art actions that highlight ongoing environmental racism. Lift up indigenous Afrofuturist feminist queer and reconstructive vis visions of the world we can create, offer a playful and enticing portal that takes us beyond what seems impossible to overcome. And what you see in the image on the right, lower right, is our canoe garden, which we built on top of what had been a putting green in our backyard. Um, and we call this navigating the flood. Um, here are some resources for you. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I don't post there very op often, but my handle is there. You can join the Arts for Change page on Facebook. It's a private group with 6,200 members, activist artists and uh, activist art teachers from around the world. Um, it was created in 2009 when my book, Arts for Change, came out. And these are some other books that I have essays in that include wonderful art projects by various people from around the world. And I will close my screen there so I can see all your faces. And <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. That was amazing. So I hope it wasn't fast. too fast. <laughs> no, it was perfect. So, so, so inspiring. I can really highly recommend the the Facebook group. I'm so, like the main way I'm in touch with you and I just absolutely love everything that's posted. <clears throat> um, so we have about 15 or 20 minutes for discussion um, and then we'll do some updates about our solidarity campaigns and what else is coming up for CAGJ and wrap up at eight o'clock. Um, so yeah, just um, maybe I'll start with a question. And then if you have questions, you can either raise your hand because there's not that many of us um, or you can put it in the chat. But I was wondering, I, first of all, have a corner spot and my 10 year old, when he was like eight or nine, came up with an idea for asking people to write their name <clears throat> down and just to have a record of names, which we love the idea. We got him to paint signs for it. <clears throat> excuse me, but we never, it never came to fruition. And every summer I'm like, we have to use this corner space. There's so much potential. We, some, we need some way of engaging the community. So I'm really, really inspired by the story hive idea and just wondered if you could describe a little bit more what it, what it is. So is there's like a prompt for people to write down anything or around specific themes and then there was specific lockdown and then you can go in and read whatever you want is that the you can read it? whatever you want um there is a website to tacomastoryhive.com where some of the members of our group have been transcribing some of the stories lovely so there's an online place where you can read things um and see photographs of you know the conception and various stages of the process. Um, I think the most important thing is that we had neighbors who were already interested, just two of them that live next door. And we talked with them about putting posters up and putting them on the store, on the porches of people in the neighborhood. So I printed up about 50 and 
Um, you know, it was pandemic. So people were still frightened to leave their front doors. <laughs> and um, we had about 25 people show up at the first meeting and more people joined all during the year. Um, we didn't complete the whole thing the first summer, but it was functional. Um, the following summer, which was just last summer, we put the final layer, which is a kind of golden honey color onto the cob. And um, we also had to refit the door of, of the structure because it got warped in the rain. Um, but one of the members, uh, one of the neighbors is a horticulturalist and she's been putting in more plantings and it's quite beautiful. And um, at one point when we were doing the street uh, mandala, the fire department stopped and they wanted to know what we were doing and we explained it to them. And then they went over to the story hive and read things. They said, we need this all over town. <laughs> so, we um, I applied to Creative Capital, and it's one of the most competitive grant grants in the country. We'll see if my karma is to get to do this project in yeah. 2024. So wonderful. In the meantime, I hope that people will do it all by themselves without, <laughs> yeah. without yeah. needing any curriculum. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Beverly. Um, Thank you for showing all of this work. You've been working so deeply, earnestly, and vulnerably all this time of your life. You keep finding new places to investigate and wonder, and you always take your outrage and turn it into something new and creative for people to wonder about. It was wonderful to see it all in a line. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. I have to say that Charles has been one of my great, um, what's the word? The person French. that I, friend, <laughs> who, no, it's not just a friend, it, inspiration. Um, Charles has an intellect and a knowledge of activism and art that is really unique and, I miss going to visit him in New York. I haven't been on a plane since December 2019, um, mainly because my husband has been too sick. And so um, at some point, I hope to visit New York again <laughs> and visit Charles. You're always, always, always welcome. Thank you. What other questions are there or comments? Go ahead, Brenda. And for those who don't know, Brenda um, leads the Artivism um, Collaborative at the farm worker led organization in Bellingham, Washington called Community to Community Development and was one of our presenters last month. Yay. Hey, um, I just want to thank you so much for sharing such a wide expanse of beautiful and meaningful work and um, it's, I've been scribbling away <laughs> during your presentation <laughs> because it's just given me so many ideas about, um, I see like a repetitive thing where you're taking people, your trauma or other people's trauma and you're able to put that somewhere and bring it through to another place of like vision and action and possibility and um yeah that's so important to to not just lose um the hope and the belief that we can make changes and so thank you and i just want to send blessings to you and to your husband um thank you you're welcome i'm glad you were here and thank you, Connie, for coming. She left before she heard that, but anyway. Um, what else? Anything I went through too quickly that you want more details about? I have a question, um, Beverly. I I feel like, also, is my um, space heater too loud? Is that bad? Um, 
I, I feel like you have a really interesting perspective on the nuclear crisis when you were making art about it. Um, and like as someone who was born way after like the height of that crisis, even though it's you know repeating itself again, especially now, um, I'm just wondering how you think about that earlier time when you were making art around that massive um, like looming crisis versus you making a lot of art around climate change today. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people draw parallels between the two crises and, and also can take it as an opportunity to um, patronize the crises as well, being like, well, we got through this crisis. There's always, there's always a crisis of a generation. We'll get through this climate change, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I wonder how you, you think about it. Mm. You know, one of the things that um, it's interesting that you use the word patronize, because I had to think about that for a minute. Um, it's it's almost like, you know, uh, the person that you're imagining saying something like that is um, cynical or um, trivializing it or saying, um, you know, it's almost a gaslighting, actually. Um, and in truth, I think they're very distinct crises and they're very, very complex in this moment. Um, um, it's important for people to recognize that there's no easy solution to any of the problems we're facing right now. And we can get very easily overwhelmed. And I was talking about this in another Zoom last week um, with some students at the Institute for Social Ecology. Um, we don't really know which action is going to have an impact at this point, but we need to do the ones that we're called to. And in order to do those, we have to take care of our hearts because otherwise, you know, we're just going to be bleeding our trauma over everything. Um, it's important to have some kind of practice that steadies one's spirit, whether it's meditation or walking in nature or working with a support group. Um, uh, it's really important to take care of our hearts and to rest and not get caught up. When I was doing the project, this is not a test, I just felt this urgency all the time. We have to solve this right away or we're all gonna die. That doesn't work and you burn out. I think my environmental illness wasn't just pesticides, it was this, I have to have my antenna finely tuned to every problem in the world. And it made me sick. Uh, it, it was not in balance. And so my advice, this, you know, looking back, now I'm 69, I was doing that project when I was 25 or 24, um, is it's going to be many generations, if we're lucky enough to have many generations, to heal what has been done. And we need to do things at the pace, or how did Adrienne Marie Brown put it? It was at the pace of trust, the rhythm of trust. The speed of trust. The speed of trust, thank you. And, um, that takes time and we have to work through conflict. We have to learn how to work through conflict and not download or push our traumas onto other people. We have to decolonize every day. <laughs> and um, I just completed a four week uh, workshop that was really interesting. It was about healing 
uh, Jewish ancestral tra trauma for collective liberation. And I learned so much about certain complexes that I carry that I was unaware of. Um, how I'd been trained into whiteness and even though I didn't pass as white in the street and people will always, you know, say, what are you? Um, and how that had affected um, the way I would see things politically. And um, I'm not a practicing Jew. I was raised by a Marxist and a scientist. So being in this context, working on trauma with other Jews was also fascinating for me because I learned about how I've internalized anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish racism and how it, it manifests within movements right now. So, um, yeah, there's a big difference between that moment and now, just because I have this perspective, um, that there's so many other little pieces that need to be paid attention to and be mindful about, but at the same time, not be overwhelmed by it. If that, I, I, I'm not sure I answered your question, but it was an inspiring question. <laughs> I feel um, I feel soothed, no matter what. <laughs> Whether you, I kind of um, I I think I my question was the intention was to like hear more of a juxtaposition between the these two times in your life that have been separated by four decades, but mm -hmm. I feel that um, your response took a took a really like beautiful journey through like like you know reminding us to recenter and and slow down and I feel like as activists we always are so feeling that urgency which can really cloud mm -hmm. the you know the intention or our own wellness so thank you for that reminder um yeah, yeah. I'm wondering I mean, yeah one other thing is that um, uh, what I learned in this workshop is that Jews carry a lot of catastrophic thinking. We are drawn to it because of epigenetic terror. And a lot of groups, not just Jews, have that. If, if your heritage carries genocide in it or persecution, you're going to be prone to catastrophic thinking. And it's really important not to get stuck there because you can't function. So how do you water the seeds of um, potential and delight in the midst of grief, in the midst of um, trauma? How do you do that? That's one of the things that activists can demonstrate. My being here giving a talk in the midst of preparing for my husband's hospice is an example of that because this gives me delight to be here. And life doesn't end <laughs> because someone de departs their body. Um, we still need to be able to hold each other and be kind and teach each other and be curious even in a time when things are falling apart. It's one of the ways we can adapt and be resilient. And we have to be resilient and rugged for what's coming ahead. So, and art is part of the toolbox that we have for that. So. Um, Noel put a question in the chat. Um, is that okay if I bring that out? She's. Mm -hmm. um, eating dinner with family. So needed to use the chat. She says, I love the way your work is hopeful without toxic positivity and the way your work channels without over identifying with rage, apathy, like the doormats. Could you talk more about that? <laughs> I think it requires a sense of humor. 
yeah. sarcastic New York sense of humor <laughs> to, to be able to um, move with rage um, and not over identify with it and not over identify with apathy. I, I'd like to know more about what toxic positivity is. It is that hallmark greeting cards? Is it, you know, what is it? <laughs> Sentimental bullshit. <laughs> I mean, I feel like as a someone who went through cancer, it was a huge part of what I was told to be. Oh, just okay. pressure. Just just be positive, and you'll get through this. And that it was a mindset that I needed to have. But I feel like it's very much a part of our culture overall. It's not, not just mm -hmm. in relation to illness that yeah. you can manifest if you, I mean, that is such a common thing. And I think it's healthy and for some people for certain things, but like, just put you, what you want out there and it'll come to you but, or oh, you no, know, there's all sorts of ways that I feel like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, Noelle, if that articulates what the version of it you're talking about, but I really relate to that. Yeah. That's her thumbs up there. Yes, Charles, you have another question. Uh, um, I, I wanted to, I was thinking about something while you were going through uh, what you were presenting that is, I think, so key to what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't mind my making this comment. You know, I mean, you you are always aware of how you're embedding your work mm -hmm. in situations in communities, in specific needs. And I think that's actually a very important characteristic of activist art. You're embedded. And if, for those who say the artist has to have a separation, they're not paying attention to how this society embeds mm -hmm. all of its hegemonic ideas in narrative forms, in art forms, in advertising. We're continually being persuaded to be in this you know, this dystopic world and to hurt one another. So artists actually, and the oldest kind of art is Grio, where you're embedded in a community. The community's well-being and their travails are some of what you narrate and dance and sing. And I think that, you know, you, you actually have carried on the struggle of how, how, I'm going to put it this way, how not to be the artist, the New York artist, mm -hmm. when that was what was presented as what should be your ambition. Right. But actually, the deep art is the one that you find by how you're embedded mm -hmm. in, in, in the world of people for their realities, not not the realities we're forced to gaze at. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, the other part of that, though, which is a very important thing, is, you know, people call it woke. I think the word also is consciousness. Mm -hmm. When can you know the story that you're living in that you don't know you're performing? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. who are you in history? Mm -hmm. Right. And 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 there's that requires an analytic capacity, which is, by the way, another kind of joy. Mm -hmm. It's a way not to be just not just to be run over by reality, because you can think past its current moment and understand how it came about. But anyway, those things, I mean, I think that in some ways your art practice is one which is actually seeking that embedding, seeking mm -hmm. that shared knowledge, which can become analytical. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, I think it's an important point that Charles is bringing up because artists in, in our current paradigm of education are trained to have big egos, to brand themselves, to uh, jump inside that career, um, uh, the marketplace and, I've had the privilege because I decided I wanted to raise consciousness as a teacher to not have to commercialize my work. But, uh, and I also had the privilege to be able to say no to the New York art world after succeeding there. And I ran away from what I saw 
is a very dangerous and seductive and sick system. And um, I'm writing about that now in my book, trying to offer to young people who want to be creative other options besides thinking you have to be an influencer and you have to be branded in order to make it. But I also look at the contradiction because it's very difficult to survive as a creative in our world. So, you know, I can say that now I don't have to make a living as an artist, although it helps if I do, because I'm on social security. Um, but I think that, that, you know, people need to find other ways of expressing their artistic gifts that serve the community in new ways, ways that they weren't taught in art school. And um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. We should probably wrap it up there, um, mm -hmm. unless somebody has a burning question that hasn't had a chance to ask anything yet. Is that okay if we... Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, thank you again. It's been so rich. Um, I'm. It really makes me dream about the possibilities for Community Alliance for Global Justice, and just like, why haven't we collaborated more already? <laughs> I think there's still time. There is still time. <laughs> um. So. We're going to transition to doing a couple of updates. Um, so first, for those of us in Washington State, um, it is tulip season, and um, a lot of people go as tourists um, to the farmlands just north of us um, to witness the incredible blooming fields of flowers and take pictures of themselves with the flowers and take pictures of the fields. <laughs> um, and we saw a really beautiful photo from one of our farm worker organizers in our time together last month um, from Edgar Franks, who's with the farm worker union, Familias Unidas por la Justicia, showing a, a farm worker in the, in the image of the fields. It was like so unusual to actually see something workers. So just for folks who are going to see the flowers, just a um, reminder that there are workers who make all that possible. And some of them stood up for their rights last year. You may if, um, help support some of the calls for justice. And we made calls to the company to respect the workers. Um, and this year, and Brenda, please um, add in quick update I'm going to make, but I just, I know that they had a series of demands to improve their workplace and the farm worker union, Familias Unidas, some of them became members of the union and they were able to facilitate a process with the company that actually achieved um, what they, what they were asking for and improving the conditions without them going on strike again this year. So it was a really major achievement of the, of the union and um, it's just an amazing, another amazing example of having this resource for workers up in, you know, in those counties um, is really making a difference for workers there. Did you want to add anything to that, Brenda? Um, no, I think you covered it really well, Heather, but we're really looking forward to celebrating, you know, the work that farm workers do because, um, you know, they do bring all this beauty to our lives and they are not highlighted. They are not on the Skagit Valley tulip posters. They are not invited to march in the um, tulip march, you know. And so, um, you know, I think it's important for allies to come out and just recognize people who do um, such hard work and, yeah, and celebrate the wins also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, I'll talk more about where we're going with this art series and how it's going to be supporting our farm worker partners in a second. But um, just other partners that we work with are um, with Northwest Tribes, 
um, to oppose genetically engineered salmon. And um, Black Corporate Salmon, as the name of the campaign, um, has a series of educational posts coming out. There's five different posts with a really incredibly successful storytelling organization called A Growing Culture. And in terms of like people who use Instagram, they have, I think, I don't know, 30,000 or more followers. Um, and it just, we've partnered with them for our African based work. Um, and it's, they're just, we actually were able to connect them with um, Black Corporate Salmon and just excited. Megan's working on one of the posts right now, excited that they're doing that series to amplify the work of that campaign. So those of you who are on Instagram at, at Black Corporate Salmon, um, follow that because it'll be, yeah, just important information um, being shared about how genetically engineered salmon is um, the company Aquavantage is trying to bring it to market for the first time. Um, we only know it's all very hidden what they're actually doing with like how how they're bringing it to market. But the one thing we know is that it's probably being served in restaurants in Philadelphia without people knowing what they're eating. Um, and they're also in the process of building different um, factories for different uh, land-based um, factories for for growing the genetically engineered salmon at different sites. And there's a lot of protest at um, the site in Ohio right now, which is try to push back the permitting process, but there's obviously corruption in the government there and they're benefiting from it. So anyway, um, we'll keep following that campaign. Um, and that'll also be highlighted in the art making we're doing next month, which I'll talk about more in a second. And then just the last update is, so we also work in solidarity with African farmers because we're based in Seattle, the home of the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates and decided to take them on for introducing or, or paving the way um, with their billions of dollars for a new quote unquote green revolution in Africa. Um, and recently we or last over the last year, we made a series of short films called Rich Appetites, How Big Philanthropy is Shaping being the future of food in Africa. And so a lot of the work we're doing right now is to promote that film series and try to get it out to more audiences. Um, we're trying to make that very complex situation more digestible and accessible. And it's with a South African animation um, studio that we produced it. And so we did an event recently at Town Hall, and then we have an event coming up um, on Tuesday um, April 25th, it's a Zoom event with three amazing, like some of the like most well-respected leaders of the African food sovereignty movement um, responding to the film. But I just heard from one of our partners who's with the Zambia Alliance for Agroecology and Biodiversity, um, Zob, that she showed two of the films to two parliamentary committees recently, which I was like, like to have them used in that context is such an honor and such a success for us. It's just incredible. So the committee is on agriculture and health. And she said the clear visual of the foundation's base in Seattle and its powerful assault onto Africa made the connections we need in order to convince the parliamentarians that Zambians still want to remain GMO free as in fact, all MPs do like the representatives. Where the money and intentions driving our policy changes coming from couldn't have been made more clearly. The two committees resolved to establish an independent caucus within the parliament to address the issues we raised and called for a Zambian-oriented food policy. And this is in the midst of this really clear assault on the part of the Gates-funded AGRA, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, who's, who's like trying to bring a new model of controlling agricultural development <clears throat> to the Zambian government and the Malawian government. So it's like a very high level of conflict right now um, within those parties. So just to see that the films actually were able to be part of that conversation was just a huge success for us. So um, hope you can come to that event or at least watch the films online, um, reach appetitesfilms.org um, and just follow that campaign. Um, which there's a lot of exciting work happening with that. Are there any questions before I just share some information about upcoming events? Okay, I'm going to share. Um, 
my screen. I always forget this part. View, slideshow. So um, just as a reminder, we're so thrilled to have gotten to hear from Beverly tonight. This is the third in our art and activism series. So next month we'll be with a queer and black filmmaker who's based in Tacoma as well, um, named Theo Calhoun, who's we've also been working with to get our film into film festivals. Um, so Theo will be presenting about their vision of of art and activism. And then on June 20th, Morgan Brown um, is an indigenous um, illustrator and poet who contributed to our third zine. This is one of uh, Morgan's artworks on the cover of our, our zine. Um, she's gonna be presenting. And then, um, okay. And then those um, webinars are leading us into two different art making workshops. So this coming Sunday, um, we'll be making a banner and doing block printing. Lisa's leading us in a block printing workshop um, to make signs and this banner um, for CAJJ's long-term um, solidarity work with our farm worker allies, um, but also specifically to participate in the upcoming May Day March, um, which I'll say about more in more about in a second. And then on May 20th, we'll be doing a poetry and screen printing and um, like prop making workshop um, with David Solnit, who's coming up um, for the Bay Area with his partner, Julie Searle, to, to do the poetry workshop. So we just planned that out this afternoon and I think it's gonna be fantastic. There'll be theater at the end of the workshop. Um, so hope lo local folks can join us. Um, and then, like I said, we'll be supporting the May Day March, um, the Marcha Campesina of the farm workers up in Skagit Valley, just um, like an hour north of here on Sunday, April 30th is the May Day March um, with those with our farm worker partners. And then there's also a May Day March in Seattle um, on Monday, May 1st. Um, and this is a slide just to remind folks of the event that I mentioned um, about our film, Rich Appetites, that we're doing this discussion with these three activists, including Frances Davies, is, is, who is the activist in Zambia, who told me about who's the one who shared the films um, in the parliament in, in Zambia. Um, there's a lot of other stuff going on. We're going to try to, well, we're going to be marching at the Earth Day March um, with 350 Seattle on Saturday. Um, we're getting involved in countering the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meetings that are happening in our region. And there'll be a, a big gathering, um, well, big protests against their meetings in August and September. Um, so we'll be getting more involved in that as well. So yeah, stay in touch, stay connected. Um, we really appreciate everyone's time and especially Beverly, let's give one more round of Zoom applause. Your work is so important and it's like really the center of my heart and what I wanna be doing. So I'm super inspired and hope, I'm serious. I wanna collaborate both neighborhood wise and with CAGJ. So we have lots of projects to work on. All right, thanks everyone for being here. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thanks so much for coming. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.